And well, thanks again for joining us, uh, all of our online family. So excited to have you guys with us as well. Uh, we are jumping into, uh, I believe, the sixth week of our series, Messy Matrimony. Have you guys enjoyed this series so far? Talking about marriages and dating and relationships and all the things. And for some of us, we've been like, there's weeks I hated because I felt just so convicted. Or there's weeks, you know what I mean, that I needed and God is moving in this relationship. Or just all kinds of different feelings and emotions and, and lessons coming out. And so I hope you guys have enjoyed it and I'm excited for today. And uh, for today, I want to I wanna start out by asking a question. We're going to see who's, who can be honest this morning, okay? Uh, <clears throat> is anybody in here, would you, anybody, would you consider yourself a binge watcher, okay? Okay, so we've got a few, and then we've got a couple people who don't want to tell the truth. That's fine. We'll work <laughs> with it. Uh, no, I, like, seriously, like, I think it's obviously a very big thing now. Uh, I'm the kind of person, you know, it's like shows don't come out like they used to, where it was like, oh, a new episode came out. It's like, no, 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 no. A whole season came out, and that's what we're spending the next day and a half doing. We're going to wear the same clothes and eat Cheetos, and that's it. You know what I mean? And that's, that's how we're going to survive. And that's, that's kind of how we do things, right? We binge watch shows. We get after it. Um, actually, in our household, Rachel and I are a little different on that. I'm like, let's watch it. And Rachel's like, this has to be an experience. She was like, this is a nine, it's a nine episode series. This is going to take nine weeks. And I'm like, you're tripping. We're going to watch it right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like there's that kind of tension there. But whatever, however you do it, um, I'd say for us binge watchers, we watch these shows and we cannot stop, right? So just to, to let you guys in, Rachel and I, uh, we just watched an entire series of Survivor. Anybody know of Survivor? Come on. This show has been around for centuries, yo. This is like, it just doesn't stop. It's literally, I think we watched season 41 as the first season, which I told Matt and Hannah Shibata, they're the ones who put us on this. If I told them we watched season 41 first, they'd probably be like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? But we watched this and I'll say, we, I had no interest. I don't think either one of us had an interest in watching Survivor. Like of the shows to binge, it was not the one we were like, yeah, you know, super excited about. Again, our friends had talked about it and I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. That's for my grandparents to watch that, you know? Uh, so we're at home one night. We had actually just got back from a trip to Atlanta to see some family. And we get home and we had a rough flight experience, if you will, and we're super tired and, you know, just exhausted, knew we needed rest. The next day we were going to wake up and have to get back into the flow of things at like 6 a.m., kids getting ready for school. Come on, my parents, you know what I'm talking about, just all the things. And so we were like, hey, we need to get rest tonight because we're already beat. We need to get into it. I was like, okay, well, let's just chill for a little bit and let's like, let's just watch something, you know? It's like, okay, let's watch a movie, something like that. So we go and Rachel puts something on and I walk in the living room and Survivor's on. I was like, what are we doing? <laughs> what is happening on our screen right now? I didn't know we had any interest. Did you, did you want to watch? She's like, it was there. So I clicked. I was like, all right, cool. So we sat down and we started watching it. And we're like, we'll watch like an episode and then we'll go to bed. <laughs> we watched like four full episodes of Survivor and they're almost an hour long or something like that. I don't know. It was like maybe three or four. We were there for a hot minute, y'all. Okay, by the time we looked at the clock, it was like almost 1 a.m. and it was time for bed. Like we were like, we just did this. You know what I mean? But it's so hard. If you've ever watched the show, okay, I'm, not, I'm just going to talk about Survivor for a second. It's insane. Like the people are ruthless, okay? And I, Jesus loves all of them. But oh my goodness, if you watch that show, it's a mix of emotions. You're like, you, you find this person, you're like, I liked them a lot. Like I, they're, they're so honest. And then you see them lie to somebody and backstab them. You're like, I hate them. You know what I mean? I don't... It's, you, it messes with your emotions so much. Well, we were so pulled in. It's what they do. So pulled in the show. Watched that. Went to bed at that time. Woke up the next day. Destroyed. Okay. God, I started getting the kids ready. We're like, we literally, I don't think I said this first service. Rachel and I laid in bed when the alarm went off and we're like, they can be a little late to school, right? <laughs> like, we were so tired, so exhausted. What's my point? Okay. Because there's a lot to that. My point is, is sometimes as human beings, we have a tendency to lean into stuff a little too much, right? We see something we like or that we want and we overconsume it. We overindulge on it. We, we want more of it. We do it so much so that it's, it may not be a bad thing. It could be a good thing, but we've taken so much of it in that it becomes a problem. It's caused issues. The repercussions of it have caused, done some damage in or around us. Have you ever been there, Right? This is a real thing, and, and the Bible actually talks about this, I'm sure, in a lot of different spots, but one specifically that I want to take a look at is Proverbs 25, verses 16 and 17. Check this out. It says, if you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it, and you will vomit, right? Something good, bad situation at the end. Verse 17, seldom set foot in your neighbor's house. Too much of you, and they will hate you. <laughs> Very good, right? It's like, okay, you can have a neighbor. You can be friends with your neighbor, 
don't hang out too much or they're going to tell you to flip and leave, right? Get out of my house right now. Too much of you, right? It's a very real thing. And it's so true with so many other things in our life. They're good things. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. But if we overindulge, if we consume too much, it can become a problem. What we have to experience, right? What the consequences of what we've done can be pretty damaging. We overdo it. We do it with screens. We do it with food. We do it with people in our relationships. And one place that I think we often miss, it goes right over our heads as one of these places where the issue is, this issue is, is in our romantic relationships, in our marriages, in our dating relationships, in those, those times with that significant other. This is a place where we can see this issue in a huge, huge way. You're like, what are you talking about? This is a person I love. How is it wrong for me to like just be consumed by them, to love them so much and want to spend all of uh, uh, every waking minute, all of my time with them, right? I should love them. It's like, you totally should. And you should want to spend a bunch of time with them. Absolutely. But we overdo it. We get into this place where there's this line of priority, okay? Like there is with so many things. And this line of priority between the relationship with our significant other and the relationship we're called to have with Jesus gets a little blurry sometimes. And we lean farther in one way than we're supposed to, right? Instead of towards Jesus, we prioritize, over-prioritize this person that we love so much. The intention is good. The heart is there. But are we missing something big? So that's what we're going to take a look at today and what it really means for us. And to do so, I actually want to specifically talk to a group, a specific group of people in here, and, and that is anybody who is single, okay? And you're like, oh, no, I knew I shouldn't have come today, right? <laughs> All I want to say, just up front, and, uh, because what we're going to get into, it, it speaks to everybody, including single people a lot. And I think that has been probably a struggle if you've been attending Grace these last five weeks. And it's not that the intention was to do this, but it's just a real thing. You get into a series called Messy Matrimony, and the focus is marriage. The focus is relationships, and it's, it's about other people. So if you're the single person in the room, you're like, I just can't wait to be done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sure, maybe there's little things I've grabbed and grown in, but this just feels like it wasn't built for me. It feels like an opportunity to come in on a Sunday and go, oh, we're still in our marriage series. I can just kind of tune out, right? And I'll be okay. And that's a very real feeling. So maybe that's you. You're like, yeah, man, I'm not, I'm not really interested in this. I'm just single and not ready to mingle, you know? Single, maybe eat a Pringle. You know, just, that's just me. I just want to chill. That's all I want to do. Amen to that, right? If you're in that spot, that's not a bad place to be. What I want to get at and what I'm trying to get at in this is this whole series and just these conversations can often make it feel like singleness is an issue. And I do not believe that that's the case. And so our goal today is to look at some scripture where we see the Apostle Paul actually talk about that not being the case. So we're going to look at this. This is 1 Corinthians 7 verses 25 through 28. Uh, and what Paul is doing here uh, is he's talking to the church in Corinth, okay? So he's, he's discussing uh, marriage. They, they're asking Paul questions like, what about this? What about marriage as a whole? What about people who are single? When should they get married? How should this look? You know what I mean? All these different questions about that relationship that people jump, that, that we all jump into, right? That, we're, that we feel we're called to jump into. And Paul's like, yeah, I've got, I've got some truth I would love to share with you on that. So we're going to look at a few big chunks of scripture from Paul in Corinthians. Uh, and we're going to start in chapter 7, verse 25. So here's what he says. Says, says, now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me the wisdom that can be trusted and I will share it with you. So first off, he just has like a moment of honesty and he's like, hey, you asked me a question. I want to come to you because I think sometimes when we read the scripture, we see that people are coming in. They're like, here's what the Lord straight up said to me to give to you as a prophet of the Lord, as somebody who knows the Lord so well. He spoke to me and said, this is what you need. And Paul's like, hey, this isn't one of those really magical moments. I'll just be real with you. I don't have a specific word from the Lord for you on this. What I do have, and another way that God works, is over time, he grows us in wisdom and understanding. And I've, I've learned over time, because of the grace and kindness and provision of the Lord, some wisdom and some understanding on marriage and this relationship that I would love to share with you guys, right? So he just gives them the little disclaimer up front, and he says, let's, let's jump into it. Verse 26, because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife... Do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. 
However, those who get married at this same time, at this time, will have troubles, and I'm trying to spare you those problems. So, some honesty from Paul, right? So let's take a look at this. Who, who is he talking to right here, right? He's talking to single people. He's talking to married people. And he's talking to people who are thinking about getting married, people who are dating, right? This is for everybody. And what is he saying to them? Single people, you should stay single. Married people, you should stay married. And dating people, it's cool either way. But just know, when you get married, it's going to be tough. <laughs> right? It's like, all right, Paul, thanks for pointing me in the right direction. It's like, what do I do with this? Where, where do I go with all this? Because it's like, it's like he's, you know, like somebody asks you a question and it's like the answer is not yes or no. And they're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Both. And you're like, what do I do? Where am I supposed to go? I would love it if this was just a do this, don't do that, don't do this, do that. It would be so much more helpful. So let's take a look at the bigger point at what Paul is trying to say. If you look back at verse 26, excuse me, Paul mentions the present crisis therein, right? He mentions a present crisis because of the present crisis. I think it is best to remain as you are. What is he talking about? What is believed is he's actually referring to the persecution that so many followers of Jesus are experiencing in this time. And that he knows that they will, uh, will receive the persecution that these people will receive and experience. And he's saying, hey, as followers of Jesus, we have a huge goal like one main goal, and that is to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the entire world. Like our job, the number one goal is to make sure that as many people as possible know about the love, grace, forgiveness, kindness, and salvation through Jesus Christ. Like it's got to be all about him. And with that being said, I need you to know that's a big goal, and this goal is this big, and we have this much time. And the same is true for us today, right? That great commission still applies to us to go and make disciples, to preach to the nations, to spread the good news of Jesus. And if you look at our life in comparison to eternity, it is but a grain of sand. We have this much time, right? So we may not experience the same present crisis as they did in that time in the day where they were being persecuted on top of that short amount of time. Paul's like, we really got to get after it, right? But we do have this same experience of we only have this much time. We only have this life to live to reach the lost for Jesus and make sure that when eternity comes, they can be there with us forever, right? We cannot waste a minute. So what is he actually getting into with this? And what I'm going to say is, is stick with me, okay? But I would make the argument that Paul is making the argument that marriage is probably not as central as the church has made it. Our marriage relationships are probably not as central to our walk with Jesus and the life that we're called to live as we have been told or how we feel or how the church has portrayed it in the past. Now, am I saying that marriage is not important? No way. Okay? Hear me on that. In no way, shape, or form am I saying that marriage does not matter, that it's not important, anything like that. What I'm getting into is over the years, the church has done a, a, a big job of really pushing marriage on congregations, on people. And that's not a bad thing, okay? That's not a bad thing at all. But for some of the reasons that it's been pushed, kind of complicates things, right? So we have encouraged people, the church has encouraged people, get married, get married, because over time we've seen a lot of people who have entered into singleness and remained in singleness lean into things that were not honoring to the Lord that we're not helping them to be in a right place with the Lord. Tons of sexual sin, so many other things, uh, uh, different beliefs that have strayed apart. And so I think the church has seen this and somewhat, not completely, but somewhat a little bit out of fear, been like, just get married, just get married, just get married. Because then you don't even have to worry about those things. And there's, there is some validity to that, right? Paul even jumps into that in this passage. And he's like, dude, if you're struggling and you want this, like, get married, man. Be with this person so you no longer have to lean in this other way, be in right standing with the Lord. It's a very real thing. But again... For those who are single in this room, what I want you to hear is that marriage is not mandatory. For you to be in relationship with another person, to marry them, is not something that God is expected of you to do to be in right standing with him. It is not something that impacts your eternity as a whole when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. And I know that seems kind of hard for us in, in the marriages to hear, but I do believe it is the truth. Marriage is a beautiful thing. Again, it's an important thing. And I believe that if you are called to be in marriage, like so many of us are, you better do it right. Right? We better pursue health. We better prioritize that person. We better seek to understand more. We better love them in the way that Jesus called called us to love everybody else and some. Right? Like 
Marriage is important. It's a healthy, marriage is a gift from God. The issue is the church has framed marriage over time as a necessity with God, and that is not the case. It is a gift, not a necessity. So all of that, to my single people, again, what I want you to hear from this is you are not a second-class citizen in the church, in the world, or in the kingdom of heaven. I think it is easy for you to feel that way, and rightfully so, right? How many times do you go visit family? I've been there. My brother's in that. He's been, he was in that spot for a long time, and like even us, with him, we'd be like, when are you going to get married? When are you going to jump into that relationship, you know? Like, come on, you know? And then maybe you got the parents who are like, where are my grandbabies? You're like, please leave me alone. I don't want to talk about that with you. Or maybe like, hey, just saying, getting a bit older. It's time to settle down. You know, it's like, bro, leave me alone, right? I think we feel that. And it's, again, it's not that what the rest of the world, Paul says, to get married is not a sin. It's not that the rest of the world is doing something wrong, right? But we are following suit in a lot of ways of just what we see the rest of the world doing. And we're getting married into these relationships. And for some of us, we just haven't seen that happen. Or maybe we just don't feel as much of a desire for that to happen. And we start to question and wonder, is something wrong with me? Am I missing something? Should I just keep pursuing? Should I try, try, try to just force it and make it happen because I don't want to be the odd person out? Am I broken? Like, what is it that's just not making this work? And we start to lose the content that we're called to have with Jesus. We start to forget where priority should ultimately lie. And that's, that's the big idea behind today. Again, for all of us, there is a top priority, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And so many times we get it wrong. And that's where Paul comes in again here in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 to 35. So why is Paul pushing on this? Why does he even make this argument that, hey, this is not a mandatory thing? It says here in verse 32, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man <clears throat> excuse me, can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him, to please Jesus. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife, which is absolutely correct, right? It's not wrong for, an earthly man, for a man who is married to do that. To, to, he's got responsibilities. I would say God wants you to take care of those responsibilities and to take care of them well and to, to steward your marriage well and to love your wife, to love your husband well. His interests are divided, Right? In the same way, a woman who is no longer married has nev- or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this, verse 35, don't miss this. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. That is Paul's point. Paul wants us to give Jesus priority. I want you to do whatever it is, stay married, stay single, stay married, right? Stay single if that means that you can give Jesus the throne of your heart. If you can fully submit, if that's what it takes to help you go, Jesus, your way over mine, 100%, I'm all yours. So you've got the space to enter into the calling that he has for you. So you've got space to enter into the plans that he has for you. It's like, Jesus, I need to place priority on you. Do you see this? It's it's really a beautiful tension that Paul creates, right? This beautiful, beautiful tension of, again, it's not wrong. And we should steward our marriage as well. We should find health in that. But because we are broken and sinful human beings, we have a tendency to go overboard. We have a tendency to look at the person we're in love with or the relationship as a whole and make it our everything. And Paul says, only Jesus is called to be your everything. Amen. Only Jesus is called to be your number one. Only Jesus is called to sit on the throne of your heart and of your life. Does not mean the other stuff is bad. But Jesus should always be the, the greater good in our hearts and in our lives. So here's, here's the big why, okay? And this is going to feel heavy to say, but it is very real, Right? If we choose to prioritize anything over Jesus, what we're leaning into and starting to experience is this really little word called idolatry, (laughs) right? We don't just do this with each other. We do it with a lot of things, with our phones, with our free time. Like we, we do a lot of stuff and we place them in the throne of our heart instead of Jesus. 
Jesus talks about this in Matthew 6, right? And he's, he's talking about people clinging to, to, to the possessions of this life and the things of this world, right? And, and, and more specifically, he even talks about money here. But what he says, I believe, it's, it's so true for every single thing because everything that is not Jesus has the potential to be that idol, to be that Lord in our lives. He says, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. Jesus has to have the throne. Because we cannot be devoted to him in a healthy way when something else is there, when something else is in charge, when something else is pulling our attention, when we've made something else or somebody else, even in our marriage, our everything, our number one priority. So does that mean if we get married, Pastor Ricky, we're committing adult, or uh, not adult, oh, chill, uh, idolatry? <laughs> yeah. We won't go there. Idolatry? No, not at all but there's a chance that we could. And that's what Paul wants us to avoid. That's what he wants us to see. Again, this is also coming from a guy, from me and from Paul, people who, Paul, Paul is completely single in all of this, right? So for him to speak into marriages and be like, you shouldn't do it. It's like, well, it's easy. You never wanted to. You want to just pursue this thing. You felt called to do this thing in your life, right? Paul didn't have that relationship. He didn't have that marriage, right? And then for me, it's like, I'm speaking into singleness. You're like, dude, you haven't been single. It's like, I know, but the truth of Jesus remains the same. And his heart for us remains the same no matter where we come from. So why Jesus, okay? You look at this big picture, and why is it that Jesus needs to have the throne of our heart? And like, like, may sound really simple and on the nose, but let's talk about this for a second. Why is it that Jesus deserves our everything, that he should have our everything, and not somebody else? Three reasons why, okay? The first reason, he satisfies my longing. Jesus satisfies my longing for something else, Psalm 107.9 says, For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Amen. Right? We've got this void in us, this emptiness that can only be filled in a relationship with Jesus, through him, through his spirit. Right? Rachel Bustos, my wife, is my best friend in the entire world. She is the greatest person on the face of this earth, okay? You can fight me on it. She's outstanding. She is amazing, right? Rachel has used or has helped me. God has used Rachel in amazing ways to help bring healing into my life, to, to, to bring restoration, to guide me, to provide for me, all kinds of stuff. Rachel is awesome. And I love Rachel so, so, so much. And she will always be the number one person in my life on the face of this earth. But she is not my everything. She does not compare to the King of Kings. Amen. And she's not supposed to in my heart. I would be doing her a disservice if she did. There is only one seat on the throne, and that is for Jesus. He's the only one that can satisfy my longing. We fill a void, and we try to place other people in that void and say, make it work. Make it feel better. Make this be complete, right? Pastor Josh talked about the Jerry Maguire scene. It's like, you complete me. No, <laughs> and they never will. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus will. Right? I was, when I was thinking about this, all that kept coming to mind is like, you know those baby toys where it's like got different shapes on each side and you got to put the right shape in that shape? It's like, this is us. We take the star side and we're like, ooh, rectangle. You know what I mean? Just like fit, fit, work, fill the void, make everything better. And it just will never work, church. It never will. Only Jesus. C.S. Lewis says it this way, if I find myself if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I was never made to rely on another human being, no matter how much I love them, no matter how much joy they bring into my life, no matter how much health that God has used them to bring in my life, they were never meant to compare. They were never meant to satisfy only Jesus. So again, number one, he satisfies my longing. The second reason as to why Jesus is, he goes beyond my limits. I mentioned that if I were to, to make Rachel the priority, I was doing her a disservice. And that sounds backwards, right? So like, but you're totally focusing on, you're totally giving her everything. Yes, but Jesus comes in and he does something that nobody else can do. He makes me the better husband. He makes me healthier than I could ever make myself. Second Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Jesus comes in and he makes us better, right? 
in every single way, in every single regard, I am a better and healthier husband when I prioritize Jesus compared to when I don't. Even if I gave Rachel all my attention and said, you're my everything, you're my priority, I would never be able to be as healthy and as good of a husband to her as if I had a relationship with Jesus. The cap is here for me. Jesus takes it all the way up here. He makes us better. I, I had this explained to me one time, uh, and I've, I've used it when I do like marriages and stuff like that or weddings, but you picture a triangle. And at the top of the triangle is Jesus. At the bottom corners is, is the couple, the husband and the wife. And as they each individually follow their path, their line to Jesus, they grow closer together. Do you see it? They become better for one another, healthier for one another. But it's an individual thing. It's not, oh, let's, like, let's, let's spend time and like, let's do Christian stuff together. No, no, no. Let me have a relationship with Jesus alone. Because that relationship alone, if I prioritize that, God will help me become a better husband. He will help me grow into a better father, a better friend, a better brother, sister, family member, whatever you want to call it, a better pastor, all of it. He does that, but I've got to prioritize him. He takes me beyond my limits. And the third thing, his priority is eternal. The priority of Jesus in my life is eternal. It'll never change. It's never supposed to change, right? This is in Matthew 22, verse 30. Jesus says, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like angels in heaven. Marriages will not exist when we go to heaven. That's what we believe. When we go to heaven, it will not be husband and wife, right? It'll be children of the one true king together, worshiping his mighty name, living with him in his glory. That's it. I don't know all the other things that God's got. But marriage there is not the thing. He becomes the priority. Now, don't walk out of here going, you heard that? Eternal mindset. Like, still love your spouse. Okay? That's not, it's not the point of today. Okay? God has good things for you now. In your marriage now. Right? But Jesus is the priority. So again, to, to my single people, to the, to the people here, God may be calling you to a season of singleness, and I don't know how long, how short that may be in your life, but you were called to find contentment with that. We are all called to find contentment with that. It just may look a little bit different. Because you don't have another human being does not mean that you are lonely or that you have to be. And I'm not trying to disregard your feelings or how it feels. I don't know. I've never been in your spot. But I know that Jesus loves you so much. And if he calls you to do something, he's going to be right there with you, helping you all the way through it, giving you exactly what you need. You just got to choose him and trust him every single step of the way. You are not a second-class citizen. And married couples, you are not wrong for loving your spouse. You should love them well. I actually have a couple of disclaimers I want to give you. First thing, marriage is, is beautiful. It's amazing. It's powerful. It's a, it's a beneficial gift from God. Proverbs 31, 10, 12 says, Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Amen. This relationship is a beautiful thing. It is a God-created, ordained thing. And it is meant to be taken care of and not to just be taken lightly. But it's still not the number one priority. It's not the relationship that makes a difference. And I'll say this too. You can love your spouse well. Because I think for some of us, we hear that and we're like, okay, does that mean I can like, Love my spouse and like, but how, how do I do that? If Jesus is my priority, do I stop loving them as much or whatever the case needs to be? You're going to figure that out with the Lord. But I can, I can promise you with him again, you can love your spouse very well and still keep Jesus priority. It's 100% doable through him. Last thing I want to encourage you to do. Check the throne. Check the throne of your heart. Check the throne of your life. Who's been given the time there? Who is sitting on that throne? For, the, for us married people, is, it, is my spouse, is the person, or is it the dating people, is my relationship, the person that I would hope to spend the rest of my life with? Am I over-prioritizing them? Am I going above and beyond in a way that I shouldn't be for them? Have I taken it overboard? My prayer, our prayer should be, Jesus, show us how to change this. Show us how to get you back to where you belong, what is rightfully yours. For us single people, am I struggling with contentment here? Am I struggling? Because it is hard, rightfully so, again. 
to see everybody else doing what they're doing and feeling like something's just wrong with me. Jesus, help me to find contentment in you and you alone. And give me strength, Lord, to know that you will provide a family for me. Think back to Paul real quick, right? His family was the church. Paul did not have that family at home. He didn't have the kids and, and, and the wife, but he knew everywhere he went, there were people who were providing for him, people sending him stuff in prison, people taking care of him saying, we are your family. We love you. Jesus loves you. And we want to show you that by being here for you every single step of the way. God has that family for you. You are not losing out on, on, on community by not having a spouse. God has people for you who you can have beautiful and rich relationships with as well in an amazing and, 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 and spiritual way, in a way that only God could do. It is available to you. I'm not saying it's easy to get there, and I understand there's the confliction, there's the issue. But for all of us, every single one of us, our heart's desire should be, Jesus, take reign, be king, be in the place that was meant for you to be. Can we stand up, church? We're gonna pray together. Uh, just want to remind you, um, seriously, if, if it's ever anything, in a second we're going to have prayer and we're going to do baptisms and all this stuff, but um, come talk to us about whatever on your heart. You know, we would love to pray with and for you, but let's pray together as a family. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time to gather, Lord, to learn, to grow. And Jesus, our heart's desire is just that you are where you need to be. Help us to get out of our own way, Jesus, and, and, and to put you right there, God. Be priority. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you for today. It's in your mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen.